tick, tick, tick. That's how I thought of it when I was about 11 or 12. And even earlier than that, even in the years before, that's how I thought of it, that there was a clock moving slowly but surely and that that clock was ticking off the time before the necessity of the most terrible of all events. And I began thinking about this when I was in second or third grade. I think it was the beginning of third grade, the fall of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And my father, who was never one to candy coat it or to distinguish between what you said to a child and what you said to an adult, which is one of his peculiar peccadilloes, he was talking to my mother. It was on that middle of the week in November when Khrushchev and Kennedy were debating about the nuclear bombs in Cuba and what the result would be if Russia would not pull out this reserve of nuclear weapons that it had secretly planted in Cuba. And everyone in America, and everyone no doubt in Russia and Europe, and everyone in the world who was even mildly conscious of reality was thinking about this single event. And probably we came within hours, maybe minutes, of a full-scale international nuclear exchange between the two superpowers each who had more than a thousand warheads at that time and would have effectively destroyed the uh, human race with any exchange on a large scale. Yeah. So I was, in, I was in third grade and I heard my mother and father. My mother would say, but, but Ted, will, will, will it, my father's name was Theodore, Ted, will it help to have the, the cans in the basement because we had a closet in the basement like everybody did in the 50s and 60s that was full of canned food for some disaster as if the cellar below the first floor was going to be protected from a nuclear fire or explosion but anyway that was the theory so there were like a hundred cans of fruit and vegetables and other things in the in this closet and I always looked at that closet that it was with a four paneled wooden closet and it walk in closet big like a room and I always looked at that closet as the kind of the proof that we were going to have a nuclear war because if my parents were saving all this material water and food then, then they must know that there was going to be a nuclear war and then I that week I heard my mother saying will it really help will we have what we need and he was like I, I don't know how do I know and he said uh, he said I remember he said even though it was more than 50 years ago, I remember he said, let's just hope we're on the edge, far out, and not, not anywhere near the strike zone, because otherwise we'll have to deal with fallout and destruction. And Well, you know, this became, in the years after the missile crisis, which was 62, in the years after the missile crisis, this became one of the fundamental structural categories of my life. I know this sounds crazy, but it, by, by, apparently by no means was I unique among children or adolescents of that era. Let me explain. Well, I had, um, I had a theory, partly from discussions with my father and others, of where the bombs would drop, what probability. One was Philadelphia, which was 60 miles southeast of my hometown of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Another was uh, Baltimore, which at that time was the sixth largest city in the United States. Now it's like 30 feathers on there. And, and I thought, okay, we're in a triangle. There's Philadelphia, there's Baltimore. Baltimore's 55 miles, Philadelphia's 60. We're in this, these are the two dangers, plus the Cumberland Fort, this, this army fort that was, that was in um, 
Pennsylvania, they had uh, massive uh, supplies of military goods, and, and, and it was a kind of central supplying uh, supplying fortress of the whole United States Army. That's only 35 miles where that could be. That could be. And I had my, you know, my brother and I collected maps. And we, we would do onion skin drawings on the maps of things. So I would take out the sections of Pennsylvania and the nearby states that were most likely to have a nuclear strike. And I would draw circles from New York, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and see where, how close to the edge, if it was a 10 megaton bomb, which is massively bigger than the bombs they dropped on Hiroshima, which existed in the 60s and 70s. And I would, I would sit in my room drawing these, these, these figures with my compass on each, around each city to see how close to Lancaster the destructive circle of the blast would come. And numerous nights, sometimes twice in a week, I would sit in a chair by my little wooden frame window. I lived on the third floor of our house. And I would, I would figure out with my Cub Scout compass which direction was most likely to have the mushroom cloud strike. And I would sit at night and I would watch at that angle out the window for two or three hours. Because I had this was the night. This was the time. And if in the news there was any tension between Russia and America or between our allies and Russia, and which was constantly happening, new, new configurations of dramatic exchanges and problems through the whole 60s and early 70s, and especially during the time of the Vietnam War, when there was a constant discussion of whether the Russians would exchange nuclear weapons to defend their client state in North Vietnam. Okay. So between the age of seven or eight and the age of about 14, this was my constant, constant theme. Where will the bomb drop? Will we be, how far will we be from the center of the explosion? Will we be destroyed by the fire on the fringe or by fallout? Will we have enough food to last until there's some kind of dissolution of the nuclear waste. Well, naturally none of these things like could be figured out by me, and, and all this was ridiculously speculative. It was intensified by the fact that we had drills about nuclear explosions in, in school, where you'd get under your desk and duck and cover, which is ridiculous. The idea that you could survive a nuclear blast by being under your desk at school was, I'll let everybody think about that any way they want to. I had two books which had very specifically frightening pictures of nuclear explosions. One was the LaRousse Encyclopedia of World History, which had a famous uh, photograph of Hiroshima, Hiroshima, if you like, um, in which the, uh, the, cloud, the, the mushroom cloud was shot from sort of a side angle from a plane moving away from the explosion. And this picture so terrified me that I put a yellow marker with tape on that page so I'd never accidentally look at it when I was reading through this book, which I, was one of my favorite books. I'd read it for, to review any period of history from antiquity to the present. And there was another World War II book I had with a fiery painting of Nagasaki. And that one I was even more terrified of, and I put an index card. I, I, I pasted, I, I, I taped an index card on that page so I'd never get anywhere close to that by ac even looking by accident. I always feared when I read a book about World War II, especially the end of the war, that I would accidentally turn a page and see, because it, it, it so terrified me that it would take my breath away and give me a, a like a kind of, it would see, I would seize up if I saw a picture of the explosion. And even years later when I was an undergrad and we had art films, one of them was, was Kubrick's great Dr. Strangelove, which is a comic film about nuclear exchange between Russia and America. Very interesting topic for comedy. Even in that film, which was, is one of the funniest films ever made, one of the most brilliant comic 
enterprises you'll ever see on film, one of the greatest achievements of, of filmmaking, actually. Even in that film, at the end, there were five or six nuclear blasts in the final, the denouement of the, of the plot, and I had to turn my head when I was sitting in the auditorium in my college, with my college colleagues. I could not, even then when I was, I think, 19, I could not look, I couldn't see the... And it wasn't until I was in my 40s that I could see photos and images of the, of the nuclear explosions. Now, why am I telling you this story? Well, one of the things that structures our life at childhood are these powerful anxieties and fears which become structural. They become a way of understanding the shortness of life, the terrible possibilities, and having internalized them so early, I, 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 I see it now as a paradigm for the way, the, one of the ways that society manipulates, manipulates its control over the body politic. This is going to sound like a conspiracy theory, but it isn't. I think we all internalize fears. For people that were children during 9-11, it's terrorism and a spread of terrorist actions. Even though since 9-11, there's been really the most sporadic, trivial terrorist action in the United States. I mean, it's not trivial if you're killed in the exchange, but on the scale of the actual loss of life, and the, it's very small. And yet we've put billions into protecting ourselves from the terrorists, the imaginary terrorists. Just as we put billions and billions, endless billions, trillions by now, I'm sure, into the nuclear arsenal to protect ourselves from the strikes that never happen. But the fear remains, the fear of the terrorist, the fear of the international nuclear enemies, the fear of accidents. And I felt a little bit, again, for the first time in 25 years, when I heard Donald Trump calling the tyrannical lunatic in North Korea, Little Rocket Man, and pushing him and prodding him and provoking him a man who has nothing to lose uh, compared to the West or, the, or our allies in such a ridiculous exchange of nuclear weapons and who has enemies in Japan and all of his neighbors. Little Rocket Man. I didn't think that was a funny title because Little Rocket Man could precipitate a massive destruction of human life. And I often think it's going to happen when no one's thinking about it, including me. When we've all gotten over our, our fears of the 60s and 70s, when it, was all, when it was going to happen. I have a feeling that's when things happen in human history. So there could be some bizarre exchange with Pakistan and India or with Israel and its neighbors or with North Korea. But maybe not, and maybe it'll still be this blankness, this, this empty space of fear filled in with nothing but anxiety, anticipation for a lifetime. It's a terrible reality. And, uh, and I think the more acute and intelligent a child is, the more likely he is to internalize the scale of this kind of, this potential disaster. And uh, I remember it still. Many times during the year, I remember those, those days and those, those thoughts and those events. And I remember the crowning moment of reading John Hersey's book on Hiroshima, which, God help us, was given to me as a Christmas present when I was 11 or 12. And I remember the story about a Japanese woman reaching down to help her child who was lying on the edge of a river that, and the whole area had been decimated and largely vaporized by the, by the nuclear explosion. And she put it down and when she pulled on his arm, all of the skin came off his body in one large piece, like, like, this, like the skin of a snake when it shed. And he was left with just this skinless mass of scars. And I remember that image. I'd never forgotten it in, in, the, in that book. And that book told a story of the suffering and the destruction of the, and in, in the most intense, it's one of the most remarkable pieces of journalism and history you could ever see is Hersey's book. And that further etched upon my mind the deep reality of this fearful 
fearful aura that hung over my mind all those years of my youth. 